Dude, we are going to energize the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by the Labour MP uh, for Dagenham and Raynham since 2001 and the author of a very interesting new book, The Dignity of Labour, John Crudders. Welcome to the podcast, John. Thanks, Will. Good to be with you. Um, So the first question that I'd like to ask is, what made you decide uh, to write this book at this particular moment? Uh, Well, um, really, I suppose it's a sort of mixture of things three sort of intersecting crises that we sort of face that sort of disfigure and threaten liberal democracy and which predate the pandemic. First is the crisis of the left, both in terms of the global crisis facing social democracy and our specific domestic defeats. Obviously, we've lost four in 11. That was one element to it. Then there was the intertwined rise of authoritarian populism that's arranging across the planet and upending our politics and threatening the foundations of liberal democracy. And I think that's linked into a crisis around work, just as the crisis for Labour is around a crisis of work. And thirdly, the long-term UK productivity puzzle, they call it, where uh, productivity's flatlined for over a decade, living standards have declined as prices have have, have risen. So cumulatively, I think all three link into questions of labour as an economic and social category, not as a political one necessarily, um, but they bend into the crisis facing labour as well and the crisis um, in terms of its relationship to what is traditionally known as its working class base. So I thought... I don't want anything out of the Labour Party. I've been, you know, it's given me extraordinary opportunities. I'm a fan. You know, I'm. it's my team. I'm with it <laughs> through thin and thin. You know, yeah. I better put, I thought I'd put my two penneth worth in. It's the first of three projects, really. The first one looks at Labour. The second will look at the politics of community. And the third will look at rethinking uh, freedoms and rights. So it's this is the first part of a three-part series looking at the Labour elements and the history of Labour and the Labour Party. Um, One of the things that you touch on in the book, quite early on in the book, is um, the film Made in Dagenham. And you make the comparison between uh, the representation of um, the interplay between Labour and the um, unions and people obviously um, working in the factories in uh, Made in Dagenham with how people feel about work now. And uh, another film that you mention it's like later in the book is um, I'm All Right, Jack, which was uh, made just a little bit before um, Made in Dagenham is set. They're both set about the same time. And I wonder, do you think that part of the issue that some people have with the way that they view the Labour Party and with uh, trade unions and the interplay between the unions and, and British industry is that too many people perceive industry and, and the trade unions through the lens of I'm all right, Jack, right. rather than through the lens of I, Made in Dagenham? I, I think that is a really interesting question, actually, because one of the points I talk about in the book is this notion of the British disease, right, of which Thatcherism was a miracle cure. Um, now, that has been such a powerful story about the British disease. But in the 1960s, at the height of the British disease, when these films were made, um, British productivity um, and annually sometimes was between 3 nearly 4%. Compare that to the flatlining productivity of now, um, and you wonder whether disease is appropriate description, but we're so locked into these sorts of categories and the way they've been represented in our culture that it makes it very difficult to start to question some of this. I try and question Thatcherism because I think that's unfinished business in the economic and political history of Britain, actually. And actually, part of the crisis of labour lies in our inability to fully diagnose the effects of Thatcherism. Consequently, we're all locked into a story about uh, about a puzzle that we're living through today. Mm. And the puzzle's almost a benign word, a sort of, it's a sort of humorous word, when actually it is a crisis of labour that we're seeing today. Deliveroo drivers, British gas drivers, the cost of living crisis, the threats to liberal democracy. But because we're so bought into these twin notions of disease, 
as you talked about in terms of I'm all right, Jack, and the miracle cure of Thatcher, we've got very little resources to rethink the nature of labour in our economy and society. That's why I used the Made in Dagenham story, which is a nostalgic story, but that was filmed on the same estate, literally anyone who knows Dagenham Road, it's the Mardike estate in my constituency, exactly the same estate that my, uh, another film was made, Fish Tank, Andrea Arnold's extraordinary film from uh, the same period, which is the end of new labour. So I try and use these films to conjure up the way labour and the working class has been represented culturally. And I think you're absolutely right. The notion of the British disease obviously portrayed in I'm All Right, Jack, with Peter Sellers is a classic example of the way political elites... Um, defined the crisis in the post-war period and so ushered in the Thatcherite remedy and their diagnosis, which eventually led to this miracle cure with which we're having to grapple with today. Do you think, and you you mentioned um, in terms of delivery drivers and, and, and Uber and some of the precarious situations that people find in terms of working, and you touch upon um, James Bloodworth's um, work, particularly his right. book, Hired. Do you think that Part of the reason that we are in a situation in which there is so much more precariousness in terms of work, people working more on, you know, um, zero hour contracts and things like that than they would have done in the past is because Thatcherism was seen as an easy remedy and the consequences of taking away um, heavy industry weren't fully thought right. through at the time. A- absolutely. I mean, again, that, that's a very well put. The notion of the miracle, we need to revisit it because I think um, there, was a, there was a small short-term boost in the initial period of Thatcherism because she said so many millions of manufacturing jobs, right? And so you had a, a short-term boost, which could have consolidated long-term structural problems in terms of our, our comparative weaknesses because we weren't investing in people and technology because we were becoming more and more reliant on sweated labour. Mm. And that, I would argue, was never corrected under the new Labour era because it bought into the Thatcher miracle, which was so powerful because we all lived through 18 years of conservative rule. Mm. So we invested too much on seeing a... Um, a route through this for Labour around technological change. We sort of thought that the working class were going to disappear. And that was, a, a, to my mind, a disastrous call. And we bet the ranch on certain assumptions around the future of technological change, which we're doing so again, not from the Blair wing, but from parts of the radical left, which were were saying that we should, which are investing in a a movement called post-workerism. They they think that the future lies in the left celebrating a post-work future. And I think that has the same problems as the Blair diagnosis that writing the working class out of the script. And funnily enough, the working class are reliant less and less on the Labour Party to secure their political voice. And I think the two are related. So yes, this Thatcher issue is unfinished business for Labour. And we need to revisit it and ask, did it really secure what people think it did? Because that has conditioned our room to manoeuvre today. And the question about Deliveroo or Uber drivers or hire and rehire. These are political choices. These are not inevitable. Mm -hmm. Um, But the trouble is we are... we are um, consumed with fashionable thinking on the left, which which says that technology is destiny, that there's an era of post-capitalism in the future, Mm -hmm. that, you know, work is ending and we should embrace UBI as a sort of silver bullet. And I question some of that because I think none of this is predetermined. These are the products of political choices and the political battles, just as they always have been. Do you think on the subject of of UBI, and you uh, mentioned uh, post-workerism and the movement that, as you say, is very popular on the uh, certain parts of the uh, hard left, if, if you want to use that term at the moment, do you think that part of the reason that it is popular is that, in a way, it's almost like uh, an, an easy route out from having right. to deal with the concerns of right. um, ordinary uh, working people? Absolutely. I think I think it's become a sort of get-out-of-jail card. It's a sort of thing of, oh, we don't really have to trouble with these really difficult people, these working-class mm. people who don't vote for us. Um, so we assume they're a bit sort of as in the... They're a bit nativist. The word traditional has become to mean a sort of white and nativist rather than traditional yeah. in terms of its relationship to the means of production, as we used to always describe it. Um, I'm interested in rethinking class in all its complexity in terms of age, 
colour, location, to try and get out from these binaries of age, of, you know, leave, remain, mm. of urban, suburban. And I think class still is a potent category to help reimagine the role of the left. My fear is this train has left the station in terms of the consequences of us fair, waving farewell to the working class, to quote Andre Gortz from the 80s, is that um, the party is becoming more and more middle class, it's becoming more and more located in London and the southeast, mm. and increasingly, ideologically, it's sort of ripe, wiping the working class out of the script. And we better correct this pretty soon because people see it and they feel disrespected and they're walking away from us. To what extent do you think that part of the issue is that because, as, as we've talked about, the, the changing nature of, of work, for some people, particularly um, political commentators, it's difficult to ascertain what um, someone who is a working class is as such in terms of occupation, right. because, because right. there are such sort of like shifts away from the more um, right. traditional uh, occupations that you associate with a particular uh, class and of course you know with the um differences in terms of home ownership and perhaps less of a um a reliance uh, for some people that in the past might have been considered uh, working class on, on council housing and such that right. there is a, a difficulty to actually pin down what people mean by someone who is working class yeah yeah absolutely and i i i, I use it in a fluid sense of a relational sense um it has a number of criteria in terms of uh, income forms of employment, sort of psychological identifications, yeah. history, family history, and the like. There, there are loads of things, but um, twas ever thus. And I don't, I don't, look, I don't want to go back to some sort of nostalgic made in Dagenham time. That's mm. not going to happen. There used to be 43,000 workers on the Dagenham plants in the 50s. They ain't coming back again. But the modern films of degradation at work, which are revealed by writers such as James Bloodworth, they demand political responses. That's why I'm interested in Biden, because Biden is possibly the most pro-union uh, president for a very long time. He's putting good jobs, good work at the centre of his strategy, 18 million new jobs. He wants all of those jobs to be um, paid enough to raise a family on, decent, organised jobs. Uh, and I really welcome what he's trying to do because he's trying to rebuild a politics of work, which is what I suggest in this um, book, um, not least because I'm deeply fearful of a future left politics of no work, mm. which people seem to be celebrating as some sort of transition out of capitalism, which I think is baloney myself. I mean, yeah. that is not liberating. That could be the route to barbarism in my mind, but... Um, so therefore, this is not just a pipe dream. Look across the pond and look what look what Biden's doing, and look how he's rebuilding a coalition across classes and ages and ge geographies. You know, you know, the sort of flyover country plus the east and west coasts. He's showing great agility and leadership, and that's the sort of program that I'm making the case for here in the UK. On the point of Biden, you mentioned. Um Later on in the book, you mentioned uh, three speeches, one of which uh, was given by Bob Kennedy at the University of Kansas, in which he talks right. about uh, the need for work and the community associated with work. Do you think that perhaps there could be more learnt by the um, Labour Party from uh, Bobby Kennedy and the, the things that he was campaigning in 1968 than has perhaps been picked up as such in... Um, terms of uh, British politics of late, because often, as you mentioned, New Labour, which, of course, um, took certain elements uh, from Clinton. Uh, do, do you think that there is a, a, a missing gap there that the Labour Party could, looking back at, at Bobby Kennedy's 68 presidential campaign, could seek Very inspiration so. from? Very much so. And that is the word. The word is what can inspire and re you know, a reimagined left today. Um, in the book, the front half of the book goes through three, di three different approaches to labour in terms of economics, sort of classical economics of the Enlightenment, Ma Smith, Mill, Ricardo, then Marx mm. and different forms of Marxism, and then neoclassical or neoliberal economics. And the second half of the book tries to look at labour through questions of ethics rather than economics and looks at three different approaches to justice. First, questions of utility 
um, which is the dominant one in the history of the left. Um, second, questions of rights and freedoms, what's usually called the sort of liberal left. And the third looks at more Republican or virtue-based traditions. And that's the one I think needs to be dusted down and, and reintroduced. And I very much associate that with the, as you say, the speech of Kennedy and also the last campaign that he embarked on before the, he was so who so tragically gunned down. And he was trying to rethink the moral purpose of the left, to return to ethics rather than simply questions of economic utility or individual rights. And that's where I think that sounds slightly abstract, but you can see it in the language and the, the way he captured the imagination and remoralized American politics for a few months in 68. Um, and that there is a lot to learn from that, I think, for the Labour Party today. We're going to take a short break now to hear the trailer for the Politics of Sound podcasts, May episode with Max Fosh. When we return, we'll be discussing morality and capitalism, particularly Amazon and Uber, the roots of the Labour Party and whether it needs to go back to those uh, early roots in the late 19th and early 20th century, the Labour Party and patriotism, and a essay that John has written for a new pamphlet released by the Fabian Society. I hope you'll stay with us when we'll be back in a moment. May is just around the corner, and that means the new edition of the Politics of Sound podcast. That's the show on which politicians and other political figures reveal their all-time three favourite albums. My guest this month is the latest YouTube sensation, Max Fosh, whose comedy videos have commanded huge audiences. But how serious is his bid to be the next London mayor? And what would be his first thought if he actually won? You might have to bleep this one out, but my first thought is shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the Politics of Sound podcast, out on the 1st of May with me, Ian Carnegie, and my guest, Max Fosh. I hope you enjoy it. In terms of um, ethics and morality, as you mentioned there, how difficult do you think that it would be to engender ethics and morality into um, global uh, corporations like uh, Amazon, for example, and others that seem to not necessarily have a ethical right. core as such? Do you think that that's something that can be done? And if so, how? I... I make the case that, um, which I'll do through the next three projects, including this one on Labour, that we we can't just talk about who's up and who's down in Shadow Cabinet or how Keir Starmer's doing in his first year. Hmm. Because of the scale of the crisis consuming Labour, we need to have to think about its fundamental purpose. And I suggest we rebuild the progressive politics around the notion of human dignity. And by that, I do not mean... Uh, a jobs hierarchy or how people conduct or hold themselves. I mean, a deeper sense of what we tolerate, um, what indignities do we tolerate in terms of our own understanding of justice today. Mm. And I think Amazon, I think they, were, they made 44 billion profits in Europe, paid no tax. Mm. The forms of employment that they tolerate, like James Bloodworth has exposed, the delivery drivers who might be earning £2 an hour through their shift whilst their chief executive officer earns £500 million on the float, the mm -hmm. hire and fire tactics employed to get rid of British gas workers, that Network Rail wanted to perform Tesco, local, other local government sites. These are indignities today that we should not tolerate anymore. And we should rebuild our politics around those ethical questions of what we will and we will not tolerate in terms of our understanding of what is a just society. And I think that can capture an imagination if we frame it in the right way, because, not least because of the pandemic, mm. where literally we had to confront the question of death. And that, I think, not just individually, but collectively gives us an opportunity to rethink the character of the society that we want to inhabit, how we live together, which is basically informed different traditions of justice in terms of political philosophy. So yes, I do think um, these questions of Amazon, Deliveroo, these are the issues that could reanimate a new politics of work for the left rather than give up on work altogether, which is, seems to me the more, more fashionable option, mm. which to me means that Labour will never win again. Mm. Do you think in, in terms of needing to focus on these kind of injustices that 
it's almost like the Labour Party has to go back to its um, roots, its, its its deep roots when it was founded in the uh, late 19th, going on to the early 20th century, when you had the, the kind of uh, satanic mills that, of course, we don't see uh, today, but the, the same kind of... Um, indignities in, in different ways right. in working exactly. conditions. Exactly. I mean, I would say these are indignities that span centuries. They take very different forms, but I think you can join the dots between the indignities of the working class in the 1890s that drove the creation of the ILP and the Fabian Society and the modern indignities and dispossessions of delivery drivers of the gig economy or whatever, you know? These are the same questions about what we tolerate and what we fight against. And I think giving up on the politics of work, which is a, a live proposal across the left today, gives up on those historic obligations for the left and duties for the left to fight on. And that that is what I fear is at stake today. Um, that's why I sort of put my two pennies worth in, because I think the, these issues are profound issues in terms of character. And quietly, without any debate, the character of the left is changing from one grounded around a discernible working class to one built around... Um, a notion of a uh, an urban networked youth, hmm. which are, is seen as the new base of the left going forward. Now, I want to link, I want to unite all ages, all types of workers together in a new politics of work and not pitch one group, which is often described as the urban salariat, against hmm. the traditional base of the left, because that is deadly for Labour. Do you think, just, just going back, um, you mentioned the uh, formation of the uh, ILP there, um, of course, one of the things that was um, driving force of the early Labour Party was um, agriculture and, and land ownership. Do you think that uh, Keir Starmer, not that long ago, made a, a speech to the uh, National Farmers Union, was right. first Labour leader since 2008, to do right. so? Do you think that perhaps getting back in touch with um, rural workers and agricultural workers is something that the Labour Party needs to do as well? I do. I mean, look, we're... We're in a trap at the moment of geography, of leave remain, of age, of education, of class, which means that we're only playing on one part of the pitch. Whereas historically, you can analyse the history of socialism in its fight against three basic dispossessions. One, in terms of labour, which we've talked about. The second is through enclosure, the uh, dispossession of the people from the land. And the third is through the vote and the franchise and the fight to gain a voice. So there are issues of democracy, labour and geography or home or belonging. And I think that latter one is absolutely fertile territory for labour in terms of um, who we speak to. We have to. We have to have a transcendent story beyond these binaries, these trap games, which contract and truncate the left and put us into little boxes which be, which whereby we become unelectable. So I think I really do welcome Keir Starmer's um, attempt to widen the conversation. And indeed, Keir Starmer, I know he gets a bit of a bad rap, but it seems to me that the, the son of a toolmaker and a nurse, someone who was mm. the first in his... Uh, uh, family to get to university, who's palpably not in it for himself, who gained an international reputation speaking on behalf of questions of human dignity and confronting the death penalty. He has the skill sets to speak to this sort of agenda, which I'm proposing. Um, he just needs to find his voice as we come out of the pandemic. Mm. Um, I'd like to turn now um, to uh, an essay that you co-authored uh, for the Fabian Society uh, with Darren Rodwell. Uh, right. In it, you... Um, discuss uh, New Labour uh, 1997 gaining seats in the South, uh, seats which the Labour Party uh, now no longer has. To what extent do you think that the Labour Party has too often focused on uh, the North and perhaps the Midlands without seeing the opportunities that it can get for elected representatives in the South? One of the things that really winds me up is this, the terms of this Red Bull debate. You know, it's seen as to reflect a few key voters in a few key seats in the Midlands and the North. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Just before the, the London elections, there's a poll in London, which has Sadiq Khan nearly 20% ahead, but behind amongst working class voters, right? Yeah. These issues are 
you know, drivers of politics across the whole of the country. And I fear if we get trapped into this red wall debate, we will forget that there are huge swathes of the country in the South that we need to rethink our strategy toward and rebuild. We suggest in the piece, rebuild a growth strategy like we're trying to do in Dagenham. And, you know, we're rebuilding made in Dagenham, if you want, in terms of good quality manufacturing, work, which gets back to our earlier conversation. And the danger is we're taking our eye off the ball in terms of the, the total lateral landscape by solely beginning to think through the politics around key swing uh, Labour to Tory switches in 40 um, Red Bull seats. And that is not the sign of an agile political strategy. We need to think much wider and deeper across the electoral landscape, North, Midlands and in the South. Do you think that part of the reason for this is because of how much of a shock it was that seats that had been Labour for decades and decades and decades suddenly swung to the Conservatives, that the Labour Party at the moment feels somewhat timid and needs to uh, regroup the seats that it, it saw as its natural base rather than thinking of a, a full uh, nationwide uh, policy for the next election. I do. And I understand the tendency because, you know, you see this as symptomatic of Brexit. Um, so we need to uh, get back to reconnecting in those key Red Bull seats. Well, I would say I don't see... Brexit is the driver for this political um, uh, reconfiguration. I see Brexit as a symptom of a deeper class reconfiguration across British politics that has been developing for 20 years. And partly that's because, to reiterate what I said earlier, that's partly because of certain assumptions that Labour have made about the nature of the economy and the nature of capitalism technology. Um, and I think there is a much wider diagnosis we have to work through in terms of our disconnections, our forms of organisational renewal, what we can learn from other parts of the country. Um, we've been a marginal seat in Dagenham Moranium since 2010. We've still managed to hold it four elections in a row and been written off every time, partly because we learned from fighting the BNP over 10 years ago in terms of organisational renewal, but also, as we mentioned in the essay, we have a trying to build a modern economic growth strategy built around manufacturing and decent manufacturing jobs for working people. So. There, there are arguments there that we need, we can deploy. We can learn from what's going on across our most innovative local government, but we need to remain agile and not get too, oh, we, not, we can't overcorrect too much simply in terms of these specific red ball seats and specific voters within them. Because this, this crisis for Labour is much deeper and more profound than simply trying to corral a few thousand voters across these 40 red ball seats. Now, something that you have... Um discussed quite a bit is the link between uh, patriotism and the Labour Party. People think of patriotism and the Labour Party, perhaps they think of the uh, uh, 1940 coalition government, Harold Wilson, uh, people like that. Why do you think that at the moment there is a problem or a perceived problem uh, between people thinking that the Labour Party is perhaps not patriotic enough and the party itself? Why, why do you think that people see the party as not being as patriotic as perhaps they thought it was in the past. Yeah, I think, I, I think the patriotism thing can be sort of detached from all of the other stuff we've been talking about, actually. It's, it's of a piece, you know? It's about what we used to call on the left, um, developing a national popular story. We need to develop a story of where we want to take the country, all parts of the country. We need to create that sense of energy and vitality, that inspiring story that you talked about with JFK. I think we can do that. There's a lot of talk about J um, uh, there's a lot of talk about FDR now mm. on the left and what he did in the 30s. I'm more interested in what he supposed what, where he wanted to take the New Deal in a more radical sense of new economic and social rights for all citizens in the country: the right to free education, the right to health, the right to work the right to security. That's where I think we should go and build that as a national mission on behalf of all of our citizens. People will connect with that as a patriotic story of renewal. That's not just to put in a, you know, a flag in the backdrop of a Zoom meeting. Mm. That's a deeper story of national renewal um, that can inspire. Well, coming towards the end of the podcast, it's been great to have you on. And I've got one final question. We've discussed the pandemic in part through the book 
uh, and the essay. And of course, because of it, we've not been able to do the same amount of things that we would uh, normally be able to do. So when things are uh, better, as they hopefully will be soon, things are more uh, back to a state of normality. What one thing that you haven't been able to do are you most looking forward to being able to do? Well, it's got to be to hug your loved ones, you know, your extended family. I come from a big Irish family, so there's a lot of us, you know, and um, we've all been very distant for quite a long time, and that's not our natural disposition, shall I say, you know. Yeah. And I like the, I, I felt quite fancy going to have a beer with some of the mates, all that sort of stuff, you know, the usual everyday things of, uh, you know, nothing too uh, grandiose, just normal family friendship issues that um, we've had to park for a long period and it's it's been it's it's sort of life's been sort of suspended for quite mm. a while and it's the little things that people I think will realize it, it, it does make you rethink what is important to you that's why it's such a good question and it will be the ordinary the everyday the familiar things that we've had to stop doing which I think we will acknowledge and recognize once again and being able to do them once more I think that's a great answer. I, I completely agree. Hopefully, be something we'll all be able to do. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. If people want to find out where they can uh, get the book, where should they go to get it? Uh, I think I think it's a bit. I think it's sold out on um, Guardian Bookshop, but they're reordering them, so you can get them through there. That's a good good source, I think. Excellent. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Will, for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.